I wanted to welcome you to the to this series on UK and Russia polar research uh, by the Oxford University Polar Forum. And today uh, we have a we have a session that is aimed at uh, at the early career researchers and how to how how, how collaboration uh, international collaboration in the in the polar regions of Russia can can actually uh, take place from the early career researchers uh, perspective. And for that, uh, I'm very pleased to have two speakers today. Um, one is uh, Saule Ahmed Kalieva, who's a PhD researcher at Manchester Metropolitan University and head of the UK Russia Early Career Collaboration uh, uh, unit of the UK Polar Network. And uh, the other one is Yulia Zaika, who's head of the international department at the Kohler, uh, Kohler Science Center of the Royal, uh, uh, Russian Academy of Sciences. Um, and also the Russia rep in APEX, which is the, the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists. So um, uh, basically the, the floor is yours. I think that we start with a presentation by Saule, which will be followed by a presentation from, uh, from Yulia. Uh, Saule, whenever you, you want. Yes, um, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you for inviting us. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I'm a bit nervous, so just bear with me. But uh, yeah, so I would like uh, to talk about the, our uh, field courses called Arctis, and then Yuda will uh, talk about our current project and our future work as well. Um, so first off, I'd like to introduce UK Polar Network. Um, so UK Polar Network was established in April 2007 as part of the 2007-2009 International Polar Year. And it is a UK branch of the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists. And currently we have over 400 members from different career stages, mostly early career scientists, so undergrads, master's students, PhD students, postdoctoral researchers, and also recent faculty appointees. Uh, and generally, one thing to always uh, bear in mind is that UKPM is an organization run by early career researchers for early career researchers. And the main aims of the UKPM uh, is to facilitate career development and networking between polar SCRs, um, also to provide education and outreach to young people and to the general public, and to disseminate polar focused opportunities. Um, so I think now Yulia wanted to kind of introduce Apex Russia as well. Um, I will stop sharing so that uh, Yulia can present hers. Yeah, I think it's a pretty, pretty long presentation in comparison with your uh, slide, single slide. I think that you need to go ahead with, with the, your presentation, so this, sorry. Okay, okay. <laughs> I will make it a, a bit later. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, okay. And yeah, that's about UK Polar Network. Um, so next, I'd like to talk about the beginning, how we generally started um, working with Apex Russia. So we had several uh, workshops for UK and Russia ECRs uh, in March 2018, first in Moscow, and then later we had colleagues come here uh, to the UK in, and we met in Cambridge at Bass. Um, and uh, it was... Uh, we had lots of collaboration and help from other institutions as well, such as UK Science Innovation Network and Norwich Arctic Office and Lomonosov Moscow State University. As a result of these workshops, uh, we created a UK Russia Arctic Early Career Group. Um, so as it says, he established in 2008. And the main aim of the group is to develop collaborations again between UK and Russia ECRs working in the Arctic. Uh, and at the moment, we have quite uh, a large uh, group there, and uh, we post uh, different uh, outreach opportunities and generally different projects there as well. Um, so after uh, kind of establishing these connections, we decided to go ahead and work on a bigger project. And uh, that's how um, Arctic uh, Interdisciplinary Studies, or as we call it, Arctis uh, field course came into life. And here again, the main aim is to facilitate bilateral and interdisciplinary cooperation with ECRs, both from the UK and from Russia. And um, we had this course run for two years. So it was February 2019 and 2020. And uh, within those two years, we had over 200 applicants from two countries. Again, uh, it, 
uh, lots of very well presented ECRs. It was very difficult to pick um, from so many amazing applicants who would would like to invite to the course. But generally, we ended up having 13 ECRs from the UK and 15 ECRs from Russia for Arctis 2019 and 17 ECRs from UK and 17 ECRs uh, from Russia for Arctis 2020. Um, as for the location, Arctis 2019 uh, took place in Apatite, Kirovsk and Murvansk. That's all in Murvansk uh, area in the Russian Arctic. Uh, it was a long uh, week long course um, at the end of February. And then uh, in order to kind of uh, discover bigger uh, uh, parts of Russia also because Russia is so big and even like people from the same country don't always know each other. It was a great way for them to kind of know, get to know the area as well. So the second course uh, took place in Khantimansisk, which was this time West Siberia. Uh, and again, it was uh, run for a week at the end of February 2020. So right before we all got closed down. So um, I think we got quite lucky there being able to have the course um, before. Okay, so both uh, times we had five main disciplines, so atmospheric studies, terrestrial studies, marine studies, cryosphere, and social and humanities, um, and we had lecturers both from the UK and from Russia supporting us. They would have uh, a little like th theoretical part inside, but then for most of the studies, um, we got to go outside and explore uh, collect samples and see uh, the infrastructure there. And like one of the pictures I'd like to uh, highlight here is in the middle, marine uh, studies. So we actually took a field trip to go to Murmansk and visit this first nuclear icebreaker called Lenin. And um, as far as feedback goes, it seems that that was everyone's favorite uh, trip. And then again, for Arctis 2020, we had five disciplines. Um, atmosphere, terrestrial, crust, cryosphere, and social. However, because this time we were away um, from the marine uh, environment, we did uh, local hydrology studies, which was again very interesting. Again, here in the picture, you can see how we're filtering uh, the melted water samples to check for soot uh, and other uh, particles. Um, Generally, organizing the field course, we did run into some challenges, but also our participants uh, also had some challenges. Uh, so I think starting this year, we decided to focus on challenges and just the ways of overcoming them. Uh, so participants, uh, especially from the UK, uh, going having to apply for a visa for the first time did have some issues. They had to receive visa support form, which uh, Julia's home institution um, kindly provided them with, and then invitation letter as well. We also were able to create application guidelines uh, for Arctis 2020, which I think made everyone's lives much easier. After that, the participants had to arrange their own flights and trains. Uh, so we had a participant last year taking trains to arrive to the Russian Arctic only by trains from all the way from Edinburgh. So I think he had uh, quite fun travels there. And then uh, again, our Russian colleagues were able to provide uh, accommodation and meals. And one thing we always had to remind our participants is that as you saw from the pictures, it's quite snowy environment, um, quite cold. Uh, so they had to have proper clothing, but luckily uh, most people working in the Arctic uh, did have that kind of clothing. So it wasn't a big issue. Generally we did have some people not being able to get visas just because uh, it seems that their home institutions were not allowing travels uh, at the time through different agencies and things like that. There were some travel delays as well. Uh, also personal circumstances. I think someone right before the field course started ended up breaking some bones uh, skiing. Um, so despite all these challenges though, we did have, I believe very successful projects. Uh, so here you can see our uh, infographics from the feedback we collected after the course. So generally everyone rated the course uh, quite high. They said it was very, very enjoyable. Yeah. They learned some and they enjoyed the organization and uh, that the course met their expectations. And also we got the rating for different parts of uh, the field studies. 
So, and uh, yeah, some pictures as well. So as you can see, lots of people smiling and uh, generally enjoying, um, uh, especially this one at the bottom, the picture by Andrei Novikov um, shows uh, cryospheric studies when um, the participants got to look at uh, snow layers uh, building up uh, in the Russian Arctic. And then we had a very similar feedback uh, from Arctis 2020. So again, we got quite high rating for how, uh, for the overall course, how enjoyable the course was, how much uh, they, uh, the participants learned and uh, how they enjoyed the organization. So, and again, uh, in numbers and here uh, in pictures, you can also see our participants smiling and uh, uh, generally enjoying the course. Um, so, because the main uh, aim of the course is not so much the studies, even though that was an important part, it was more about creating the links and collaborations. I think it's very important to highlight that we got lots of good feedback and uh, the course itself is more than just a course. It's about collaborations, it's about friendships um, and people having fun and having uh, a good time. And. Uh, I included here a couple of pictures. So one of our Russian participants from Artist 2019 uh, was able to take a beautiful picture of Northern Lights. And then our participants from the UK tried to go hunting for Aurora as well. And uh, all they got is just dark skies. <laughs> so yeah. Um, and again, uh, this whole course is for fostering links between the next generation of Arctic scientists. and. Uh, Generally, when we have some sorts of other conferences and meetings, uh, that are not only Arctic, uh, Arctic related, but something else. So like here, it's um, a conference, UK Arctic conference in Loughborough, I believe September 2019. And here we got together with some participants, lecturers, organizing committee as well. And uh, people always call themselves Arctic alumni, which I think is very, very nice. Um, so yeah, uh, this is me. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I guess I'll pass the mic to uh, you, now. Thank you, Saule. That was great. Um, uh, it, yeah, it definitely looks like a like like a very uh, like a very enjoyable um, uh, initiative. Um, I certainly have se several questions uh, about Arctis in particular, but uh, normally what we would do would be to follow with the second presentation, and then we kind of have all the all the questions uh, at the back of the two presentations. Uh, if that's if that's fine, then we continue with uh, uh, with Julia now, and uh, and then whoever whoever has any question, please uh, please uh, you you can you can write them on the chat or you can uh, get ready and then ask ask them uh, later later after after Julia's talk, uh, either about uh, uh, Saul's uh, presentation now or or the. Uh, uh, upcoming uh, Julia's presentation. But thank you very much, Saul. Julia, now the floor is yours, as they say. Yes, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Saul, for, for a great presentation. It was nice to get back to those times. Uh, it was great. <laughs> and I will give uh, just a short presentation first about the Apex Russia. It's going to be quite, quite, uh, quite quick. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So uh, just to give a very short update on Apex Russia, it has started uh, originally in 2008 um, from the um, uh, IPY conference. I think that the most of uh, Apex communities has started during IPY because Apex itself is the baby of IPY, the project within the IPY. So, um, and it, it was one of the first, as Soleil also mentioned, UKPN has formed during that, that time as well. Um, one of, of uh, the first uh, and slow um, developing national committees with an apex umbrella because Russia is quite big and we try to involve and engage uh, uh, all the regions uh, within Russia, most of them. Uh, so it's um, it's a hard task. Um, and I served, um, actually 10 years ago, I served as Apex president uh, at international level. And it was a great uh, experience. Um, and I encourage if 
if there are many of young scientists uh, at this meeting uh, right now, I encourage all of you to get involved in APEX because it's a great experience and you can learn how all the international organizations serve and how they uh, organized um, within the administrative context and how uh, the uh, science agenda <clears throat> is structured, the international science agenda is structured. Um, uh, at the moment, we have, uh, I think, at 25 uh, council members, we have this structure um, duplicated the um, uh, international, APEX International, uh, because it is a working structure. Um, and for our um, committee for uh, that big country as well. Um, so we have council, we have the executive board and we have the Arctic office, uh, which uh, aims at administrative tasks. And we also have the mentoring organizations, which are Kola Science Centra and Lomonos of Moscow State University. And we have a lot of different activities, outreach activities, um, uh, collaborations with international organizations. And also we have, uh, of course, collaborations with the other national committees of APEX, uh, which are, I think at the moment, more than 20. Um, and UKPN is one of our uh, loveliest and best <laughs> committees, national committees of APEX that we collaborate with, as you have seen from Solis presentation. So we have a lot of different um, activities, uh, uh, educational outreach activities and so on. Um, so and you can stay tuned um, at our uh, here uh, by accessing our accounts. And the um, other organization I will uh, quickly drop to the other um, to the other um, presentation. So I'm going to tell a little bit about the self-reflection to the successful collaborations and Sole has already mentioned that we uh, has um, decided to focus on challenges um, and as you as you have seen from her presentation, um, all the all the uh, um, field courses, both field courses, has been organized, uh, has been developed, implemented, and organized by early career researchers for early career researchers. And of course, we uh, did have a lot of support from uh, senior scientists and uh, from senior organizations, but we were quite keen to organize uh, all these uh, things ourselves because it's a very good practical um, practical endeavor. So as Sole said, we have started from, um, from actually 2017 discussing some potential collaborations in Washington DC during the AMAP conference. And then uh, with the um, workshops in Cambridge, in Moscow and meeting in Davos during the Polar 2018 conference. Then we, um, we, we had uh, Arctis 2019, Arctis 2020 and some meetings at different conferences. And right now we are moving online with the whole world. So uh, we, um, after this, two great uh, field courses uh, that we also designed ourselves <laughs> as well. Uh, and I think that we are very, very proud of that. <laughs> and as Sole said that we, uh, we put, um, at times we call, we call these field courses our babies because we have, we have developed them ourselves. We have implemented that. So it's, it's quite a precious, uh, bo both of them are quite a precious things to us. Um, and uh, we tried during those courses, we tried to involve uh, a lot of different partners. Uh, as you can see from this slide, I, I tried to put all the logos together and it was quite wide range of different partners. And it, the interesting thing, um, as we have already um, quite several times discussed the outcomes of, of the projects of the activities, uh, it's, it's not uh, those, Field courses are not only about the uh, bilateral cooperation, international cooperation, but it also the cooperation within uh, Russia itself, because we did have the inter-regional and intra-regional in between different organizations uh, within different regions and within the single region uh, of Russia. So it's it, it, such kind of um, activities, they have a lot of outcomes, uh, not only on international level, but also within Russia itself. Um, and uh, it was a very good learning process, as Sole said, because we did have faced with a lot of different, uh, oops, sorry, with a lot of different um, 
challenges and the current projects that we undertake is about the challenges. Uh, but first, I would like to mention a little bit about the Call Science Centre because we uh, we have in Apex Russia we have it as one of our mentoring organization and it was the the lead implementer of all the projects, um, the financial implementer that is very important to, to us um, as well. So Call Science Centra uh, has celebrated its 90th anniversary uh, last year. And we are located in Murmansk region uh, within the Arctic Circle and the whole entire structure is located within the Arctic Circle. And we collaborate with more than 20 countries, more than 100 organizations. We have different uh, projects. We have different formal agreements with our partners, including, for example, um, uh, British Embassy in Moscow. Mm, we are representing at different uh, Arctic organizations, uh, for example, UArctic, um, IASC, uh, Interact International Network for Terrestrial Research and Monitoring in the Arctic uh, as a partner. Um, and also, as uh, I have already mentioned, we mm, uh, mentor as the Colossine Center, we mentor Apex Russia and uh, also have uh, some of our researchers involved in our International Arctic Social Sciences Association. And the geography is unique, so we have a lot of uh, a lot of projects going within the Cold Arctic program, which is the cross border cooperation program, uh, and it involves four, four uh, Arctic nations, uh, which is Sweden, Norway, Finland, and uh, Russia. And you have seen from from the map, um, you can see it uh, from the map uh, that regions um, which are involved are mostly Arctic regions. Um, and we also have the infrastructure uh, at Svalbard, uh, the research um, station in um, Barentsburg. And we uh, just recently on 5th of March uh, last week uh, had the webinar uh, with the help of uh, Arctic Office NERC. Um, so you can uh, find uh, the link and video um, at their website. Uh, and yeah, getting back to the project, sorry, it was like a <laughs> promotional minute. <laughs> um, getting back to um, our project. Uh, so when we realized that we have in involved a lot of different partners, we have gone through all the challenges uh, ourselves and it is important uh, it is actually important uh, to have a good partner from Russia uh, and from the UK. So it was the uh, great matchmaking um, because you need to be, you always need to be flexible uh, when uh, overcoming different challenges. So um, we realized that uh, there are some obstacles, of course, uh, with um, mainly maintaining uh collaborations but all they can be um overcome and we've decided that we need to evaluate because when we um when we meet each other at the conferences we realize that all those uh challenges uh obstacles and even successes they all have uh the common ground and with this with this current particular project we try to a evaluate uh what kind of challenges uh are exist, uh, existing and what we can do with them. And we call that project UK Russia Arctic Science Priorities Project, which is based on community consultations. Uh, the best way to get more information and to understand the problem is uh, to get uh, to the community, to the end users who are involved in collaborations. I'm not going to talk about community consultations themselves, but just want to say, uh, that it is quite common, um, quite common uh, method, procedure, or let's better say approach uh, in the um, in the Arctic arena. Uh, at the moment, so we have a lot of existing examples. For example, within IASC, uh, which evaluate the state of Arctic science, and they have released re report last year. Uh, we also have U Arctic, uh, which has. Uh, worked um, on the report on scientific cooperation within the Arctic and many others, uh, for example, with an Arctic science ministerial process. So I encourage all of you just to read through all of them. They, it is a very interesting uh, reading. So we uh, 
try to evaluate all these reports um, and also put within our process. Uh, and it's been two phase process. Uh, first, uh, in November last year, we uh, undertook uh, the survey uh, and asked uh, uh, ask participants uh, of the survey just to share their expectations from collaborations and um, you can see that uh, we ask a lot of different um, questions and I try to cut a few quite tricky. Uh, for example, how long have you been working uh, in Arctic research? And um, as you can see from this uh, diagram, uh, that most of respondents uh, have said that they have done less than five years experience. Um, then we, uh, we asked, are you currently involved in UK-Russia collaborative research project? And as you can see, that 66% of respondents said no, uh, but uh, they are very keen to do that. Uh, that's why they have participated in the, in the process in, in the survey and also in our um, conference, uh, which has been the second phase of, of this, uh, let's say, research. Uh, and we also, uh, asked a uh, different number of questions, uh, but one was what are the driving forces behind doing, wanting to do a UK-Russia collaborative research project? Um, and you see that uh, there's been a lot of uh, different answers. We still are in the process uh, to evaluate them and we aim to produce a report soon in the mid of April. Uh, but the second phase, uh, as I have said, uh, set um, of this process has been conference that we are undertaking on 18-19 uh, of February um, with the interactive uh, sessions, uh, uh, breakout groups, where we uh, try to have a lead discussion on what are the existing gaps uh, and what we need uh, to do uh, to move over them. So stay tuned uh, and we will have uh, the summary report published um, online soon. Uh, and also just want to um, say that we are going to uh, make a presentation on uh, this uh, project um, more uh, detailed um, on 16th of March uh, within the Research Consortia um, event um, at the website um, UK Russia Alliance uh, .ru. it's the University Alliance. So thank you um, and looking forward to questions. Uh, thank you, Yulia. Um, if you can stop sharing, yeah, great. So um, I'm gonna put, uh, how do we do this? The um, overall gallery, yeah, there we go. So I can see you uh, all. Uh, so uh, again, I have I have several questions too, but of course the audience might have some. Uh, uh, Konstantin Grivanov uh, uh, wrote uh, wrote a question in the chat, uh, uh, basically asking whether is it is it time to expand the project to the Northeastern Federal University in Yakutsk, as they do a lot of uh, Arctic research, but many times in collaboration with Chinese colleagues, probably due to the geographical. Proximity uh, in that in that uh, in, in that region of Russia. But that, that's a question from Constantine. If you want to add something, Constantine, to the question, uh, or if that's enough. No, that's fine. So yeah, Yulia, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. Um, actually, we had this idea uh, while I've been um, in 2019 in Yakutsk uh, participating in North uh, Sustainable Development Forum. Uh, we talked about this, uh, but uh, at the time we have planned uh, Hantimansisk uh, um, school, um, uh, and we thought that it would be nice to have the, sec the, the, the next one in Yakutsk, to be honest, uh, but uh, you see that uh, actually pandemic situation has stopped our plans, unfortunately, yeah. So maybe if we will uh, get back to the same format, it would be great to have uh, that. Um, uh, to have that, uh, that kind of um, field for us in, in Yakutsk as well. Thanks. Thank yeah, definitely. Uh, it, would, it would be 
I mean, you have had plenty of room to choose in Russia to organize next uh, next field courses, definitely. Um, uh, yeah, I was asking people if if you feel brave, uh, turn your cameras on and it becomes much more kind of human. And then apparently the Yamal lab is cooking so they cannot uh, turn the camera on, even though now I feel much more attracted to them turning the camera on to see what, what's going on there. Uh, but in any case, um, I, uh, I have some questions. And please, uh, since we are about 17 altogether, feel free to just uh, chip in and, and ask questions uh, uh, as, as, you, as you see fit. But I have a question for, well, actually three questions for Saule um, about the Artes initiative, which I think it's, it's great. And I wish when I was a PhD student, it would have existed. Uh, but uh, the question is, uh, well, uh, the first one is, will it, will it continue? And of course, now it's a strange year, but uh, it, do you have some sort of confirmed plans about this going on forward as, as the situation improves uh, beyond online? Um, thank you very much for your question, Mark. That's a, that's a good one. <laughs> to be honest, um, I don't know. I'm not sure because we have to keep applying for fundings um, every year in order to have this kind of uh, events happen. Uh, so as Yulia was saying, uh, for this year, we're obviously we're planning to have some sort of face-to-face -face event. And we're thinking of having like a smaller scale, a bit more focused workshop. Um, and we kind of, you know, looked at the uh, expenses. We're thinking maybe Cambridge would be a good time uh, this year, just because we keep going to the Russian Arctic, but I'm sure that our Russian colleagues would also like to get a chance to visit UK. And we do have, you know, this Lake District <laughs> to look at uh, post-glacial landscapes. Um, but obviously uh, it didn't happen. Uh, so we had this online project, which actually I think worked out quite well. It was very different, I believe, from all the other conferences that we've seen because we actually tried to make a study out of it. Uh, so hopefully if we get funding, then we will keep having similar events. Uh, perhaps Yulia has more to add to that. <laughs> Okay, yeah, Robert, not, to not know. yeah, Yulia, sorry. No, 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 that, no, not much to add to what Sole has already said, yeah. Um, link, link to that, who, who decides the topics and who teaches in this field uh, course? Since it's all organized by early career researchers, I'm, I'm curious. And, and linked to those, uh, what do you do with the data? Is it just uh, data in a way that, that you, you, you aim to use in the teaching? Or, or are you kind of having some kind of bigger ambition and trying to keep that data or to use it in, in a way that it kind of uh, accumulates and, and can be later used. Um, sorry, is, is that question for me or for you? <laughs> well, it's about Arctis. Uh, I guess that who, who, whoever wants to uh, answer, I, I'll, I'll, it, 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 you decide who wants to answer, of course. I can, I can answer. Uh, yeah, go ahead, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, well, you know, um, when uh, the idea first came to our heads in 2018, uh, we, we decided to have, uh, we, we didn't um, keep it in mind as the traditional event or something. Um, so 2020 was uh, the second one and 2019 was the first one and we decided it's going to be a test one. Uh, so the program was not very much structured. And we, um, we only decided that we need to share the understanding how the interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary studies happens because we had uh, the groups of different uh, early career researchers uh, from different fields. And it was actually very interesting to see because interdisciplinarity is one of the um, agendas at the um, important points of agenda of sci science agendas at the uh, uh, international level um, uh, interdisciplinarity itself so um, it was interesting to see how uh, for example young scientists from uh, the terrestrial studies are getting into the interviews within social sciences and I think that's all I can say uh, that it was interesting to see um, how the learn uh, different approaches and methods with the different sciences. Um, but then in 2020, it was uh, more structured. Um, and we we actually, it, it is a very good question. We didn't um, made any data out of it, uh, the science, science parts. 
um, it would be nice to have that uh, though, but um, I think it all depends on funding. It, it, it's been a lot of interest within this concept, the field forest, some kind of a traveling field course, understanding different regions within Russia and uh, making uh, connections and partnerships with different institutions uh, within Russia and within Great Britain. And also talking about senior researchers, uh, lecturers, it, it's been the number uh, for, for the field course 2019, we have opened the call for, uh, for lecturers for the course. Uh, the call for young scientists and call for lecturers and we had uh, I think three three lectures from uh, the UK and three lectures from uh, uh, from from Russia so it's been a, a quite good range of, of people from different disciplines professors and um, uh, senior scientists yeah thanks any question from the audience Yes, Maria. Hi, sorry, I was looking for the raise hand function, but I couldn't see it in time. Uh, yeah, building on that, I guess, if we're looking in the future with future courses to use the data somehow, then maybe talking to the plant functional trait course people. I mean, I guess Mark knows a bit about that and how they've used their data as an example of something which I think started off as like a, a it's very similar building international collaborations in plant functional trait research specifically, but they've always done it in a different location and then managed to use the data, I think sometimes more successfully than others, but um, so it's not, I'm not, yeah, but there's just something maybe we could think about as well. Yes, yes. Um, of course, the plant functional traits, I mean, this is a much more niche course in which people are interested mm -hmm. in a very specific uh, trait, let's say, of science, where, whereas these courses are much more across the across the range. But, but uh, since I think it's a good idea and and it probably has future over the years, you're going to have so much experience uh, uh, of many different places that it would be nice to have some sort of thought about how to build, uh, you know, on uh, one course on the top of the other, so that at the end of the of the years you are not just having memories, but actually you might actually have some some interesting uh, baseline da data about uh, whatever aspect you decide uh, uh, that, that might be, you know, recordable or, or, or sampleable. Not, not everything will be, uh, will be uh, you know, potentially uh, usable in terms of future data, but, but it, it might be that, you know, imagine that this goes on for the next 10 years and suddenly you have 10 places with, you know, similar experiences from both the social and the natural sciences. It looks like you can actually potentially, you know, gain, gain a quite an interesting data set. Um, yeah. Uh, any, any other comments? Can I just quickly add to that, please? Uh, thank you very much, very much, Maria, for your suggestion. I think it's a really good one. We didn't really think about that, but we'll definitely think about it more in the future. But the idea was having like a, a smaller workshop this year that well didn't happen, but hopefully will carry on next year. Uh, was that it will be a smaller group, a bit more, you know, we'll choose people from the same discipline perhaps, so they can create that kind of data set. But um, I'm guessing just collecting whatever we can and then seeing if we can work with it is uh, a very good suggestion. So yeah, thank you. Great. I see a raised hand uh, from Henry Burgess. Great. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. And uh, Julia and Salia, it's good to good to see you again. And uh, thank you for the references to the work of the Arctic Office. It's been a real pleasure working with you and, and other colleagues over the last few years. You've done an enormous amount to, to infuse the community and generate lots of new connections between Russia and the UK. So thank you very much for for that and, and all that you all that you do. Uh, I mean the NERC Arctic office is is very interested in in supporting early career researchers, particularly to help lead on to kind of practical connections in the future. Uh, we're very conscious that the early career researchers now are the obviously the middle career and later career researchers of the future and people that are connecting and working and learning together now will be exactly the kind of people who are uh, applying for grants and winning money and working together in the in the Russian Arctic and, and beyond in the future. So 
where there are future opportunities for for us and and the other teams that you that you work with uh, we're very keen to to continue to support the the uh, the personal connections but also make those links into practical work as well so wherever we can help with that we we're very happy to and i hope when covid travel restrictions are eased we can see some of those uh, some of those links we establish we um uh we kind of we were really pleased to have a uk russia bursaries program that was supported from the uk recently uh and that was interrupted by the covid um work but it was really good to see some of the early career researchers were applying through those systems and, and making those connections so apologies mark it wasn't really a, a question it was more a comment but uh, thank you for the time anyway <laughs> thank you. You, you you were very institutional uh but uh, you know, uh, very good. Uh, well, definitely, I, I would like to stress uh, and, 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 and repeat, you know, the, the fact that your effort as facilitators of uh, network building is is huge, hugely appreciated and probably more important than you than you realize in a way, uh, just because you know you, you want to do it, but then there are so many people who benefit from it that uh, that that really drives drives. Uh, Many people's lives in a way. So yeah, thanks for that. Um, um, I have another question, but if anyone else has any any uh, any comment or question, please mm, chip in. Good to see you, uh, Sasha Sokolov from Lavit Nangi. <laughs> you finished cooking? <laughs> no, I'm on my way. It's just bored, and I make minimum stuff. Thank you for inviting, and happy to see many of you. Um, well, so, all of you, but many of you especially. Um, uh, yeah, my question is, uh, yeah, well, good to see you here, uh, um, Sasha. My question is about uh, about the, the community consultations uh, that Yulia was doing, um, or Yulia was talking about. And uh, you identified um, the reasons that, uh, that people have to wanting to do a collaborative research in, in Arctic Russia uh, from the UK and, and our UK uh, Russia collaboration. My, my question is whether uh, you have a list or you asked uh, the opposite. Uh, what, what is seen as the main barrier or the main problem uh, and, or, or why is this willingness not realized in, in, in from, from the side, of, for example, from the side of the UK researchers into doing research in the Arctic uh, regions of Russia versus other regions uh, of the Arctic. Yes, thank you so much, Mark. I, I think that I can answer that question. And uh, hello, Sasha, haven't seen you for ages. <laughs> First of all, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, a very, it's a very good question. And also I wanted to uh, second Henry's uh, comment uh, because uh, from both those uh, field courses that we had, we had a lot of outcomes different outcomes uh, that we still are trying to analyze and understand. And that's why we decided to have this community consultation uh, to also our, um, to pose questions to ourselves because we need to make this self uh, reflection to what we have we have done <laughs> what we uh, want to do uh, next. Um, and um, within community consultation uh, at the first uh, phase, which has been survey, uh, we pose uh, to respondents uh, questions related to our own experience with the barriers and challenges we, that we have faced when implementing uh, Arctic courses. So those are uh, like logistic, logistics barriers, uh, cultural barriers, maybe language barriers. That's the, the number of different um, different obstacles that we we will uh, describe in our report that uh, will be released in April. Um, and then uh, when we uh, when we saw out of that uh, out of answers from respondents, uh, we realized that uh, most of them have uh, a lot in in common. And I think that we always have these discussions within Interact as well. And I, I remember we had these discussions a lot of times with Sasha, for example. <laughs> uh, we, we talked all, all, um, a lot of times about different challenges and obstacles um, in making international collaborations, especially in the field. And um, we thought that it would be great with the conference, the second phase that I have mentioned, 
uh, to have a, a more open dialogue uh, with those people who have uh, different experiences, uh, with, from no experience of collaboration to more extensive experiences. So we will publish uh, the outcomes and results in April. Stay tuned. <laughs> All right, yeah, we will stay tuned. Uh, thanks. Um, definitely from, uh, from, from my point of view, definitely uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a research researcher based in the UK who, who often uh, does research in, 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 in Russia, uh, there, is, there is extra layers of uh, admin and visa and, and permits that, that are definitely a, a, a something that we need to consider when we decide that, we, that, 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 that doing research there might be, uh, might be the, 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 the way to go. Um, and of course, language, but uh, we were discussing this before, uh, of course, apart from, apart from the language, what we really need is uh, collaboration and teams in Russia who are working together with, with us. And so in this aspect, this, these barriers become uh, much less a barrier, uh, actually. So uh, yeah, uh, any questions uh, or uh, yes, Ingrid. Yeah, hi. Um, so first of all, thanks for a really interesting talk. And uh, I was one of the really fortunate people to join the first Arctis trip in 2019, which was fantastic. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, but my question, and, and it actually relates to that experience, because I had a great time. I learned a lot on the trip. But I think one of the challenges is maintaining those connections afterwards. And, you know, I haven't been able to stay in touch with many of the people that I met there now a couple of years later. So I was wondering whether um, Sally and Julia, whether you have any thoughts on how to facilitate longer term contacts? Um, have you already maybe got some experiences of what have, has worked well? Um, are there examples of, of um, collaborative projects? Or um, do you have any other ideas for what, what you might do with the growing community of, of Arctis um, alumni? So let's go and meet on you. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Ingrid. It's really good to see you. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for your question. I must admit that Ingrid is one of our very uh, active post Arctis <laughs> alumni. Um, and we've seen, uh, we've, we've been in touch with Ingrid, I guess, throughout the different uh, talks and conferences and things like that and she was in a couple of the pictures as well <laughs> if you noticed but um, yeah uh, I agree with you it's really difficult to stay in touch with people um, I'm afraid at this time I don't really have an answer to the question we did try to kind of create an Arctis uh, group uh, on Facebook we have um, an uh, UK Russia Arctic ECR kind of website where people can access different events. Um, but uh, luckily, there are some people who are still active. Um, so we had um, two people who are now in the team who actually helped us organize Arctis 2020, also joined the project through becoming participants of Arctis 2019 first. And then another good example would be uh, perhaps some of you in Russia know him, Evgeny Zarov. Uh, he was a participant in Arctis 2019. Then uh, uh, one of the organizers uh, in Arctis 2020, and now he's kind of trying to lead his own uh, collaborative projects as well. Um, so I think it's really, um, from what I've seen, is a lot of the times, the, one of the main challenges is that people don't know where to start. Um, so I think, the, we give a very good base for people to kind of um, get to know each other and start talking. Um, I guess uh, the challenge there is that a lot of the times ECRs, like I can say from my own perspective as well, are a bit shy and don't really know how to approach more senior researchers. So that's always uh, a challenge. But generally, it is all about people to people connections. So uh, at this time, we just see that those people who are still staying in touch are the ones who actually want to. And they, there, are, there are many ways, such as Henry uh, mentioned the bursary program, for example. Um, and uh, yeah, um, Yulia, perhaps you have more to add to that. 
Um, yeah, I think that it's one of the challenge, um, most challenging um, issues, um, I would rather say, but if we will evaluate, for example, 17 to 17, um, it was 17 participants uh, in 2020 from Russia and from UK, so it le it's like 34, six of us are still involved in in implementing this particular project, <laughs> uh, um, Yevgeny and other um, some other participants from Arctis 2020 are implementing the other project at the moment. Um, then we have um, uh, one participant from UK side actually starting uh, her studies in Saint Petersburg, I think. Um, and and there are quite a few examples actually on uh, maintaining uh, connections, which is good. It's not always about 100% uh, connections and collaborations, but at least we do have some examples, which is a very good start, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Saulia and Julia and Ingrid for the question. Um, yeah, I mean, I have many memories about uh, very nice uh, group dynamics uh, in the past where you think that the connection will just last forever and then uh, there is always uh, some uh, some lost connections on uh, in the way uh, uh, but some stay and probably that is uh, the real the real positive side of this of these uh, events uh, but yeah um, okay uh, any other any other comments or question um, good to see you Rosa Ah, hello, hello, Mark. Hi. Yes, thank you uh, for invitation and uh, good evening to everybody. So um, I, I just think that uh, well, uh, we discussed uh, almost uh, this all important questions, which are possibly important to know. But uh, I think it's also important to mention about the present situation, which is going on now in Russia about um, foreigners who are doing research there because maybe for some foreigners, I mean, for people who are coming from abroad to Russia, uh, it's easy to do research, but there is also another wave uh, about foreign agents, for example, who are coming to do some kind of spying work. And I think uh, Sasha maybe uh, he can talk about this because yeah, we are so sensitive actually and vulnerable also when we are coming to do research and you, you do not do not have any when you don't have any good explanation one why you are coming actually to do your research then i think people they can just make some kind of um, different ideas strange ideas why you are coming there as a foreigner and therefore maybe it's good just to make your your research aims and all these things as transparent as possible and just to inform officials, for example, that you are coming to Russia, for example, for doing some kind of research and then also to have some kind of supportive documents because, of course, it's nice to do this work in international team and also I think it's very productive but at the same time, I think um, as a researcher, you can be also traveling alone, you can be also vulnerable in many cases. And so, and when you're working team, it's very supportive and also, um, yeah, it's, it's just nice to know what people are doing and just to work in one team. So I, feel, I think maybe uh, it's better to ask more Sasha Sakhalov, for example, because he knows how to work uh, with uh, researchers who are coming abroad to Yamal and how to do this work also. And he is very successful in this. And so, yeah, and with, together with you, Mark, we were in, um, I think, one field work in the country in Yamal. And I think it was also a very international team. And yeah. It was a good time, and also we got we got very good results. I think when we were in this uh, joint field work. Thank you. Thanks, Rosa. Uh, yeah, I guess your question is about. Uh, well, definitely, if, if I can relate to that question, uh, uh, being in a group where there is a, a Russian uh, Russian members in in Russia doing research, 
uh, helps me feel uh, much more uh, at ease with what I'm doing there in case that uh, someone starts asking why are, why are you here and what are you doing? Um, definitely that, that kind of a aspect of, as you were mentioning, vulnerability uh, gets, gets quite out of the way if you are in a, in a team which involves uh, both Russians and, and, and foreigners, as you are, for example, in Yamal doing, doing research. But I know if uh, uh, Rosa was asking directly to Sasha, so I don't know if you have anything to say, Sasha. Yeah, Mark, it seems I have no choice, basically. But uh, I won't like to ask you to interrupt me if I will speak more than three or four minutes. So again, thank you very much for invitation. I would like to follow the many initiatives with such a wonderful people. Yulia, you are right, it was an ages and I hope that uh, that the Henry is still running every day and um, so many of you I miss a lot with international meetings and uh, but the thing is uh, I would like to share my feeling the life going to be more difficult now with that online meetings. They are so numerous and I basically no time to attend all of them. Anyway, I just want to say that this particular meeting is so important, but I kind of lost it. But uh, truly, I would like to pose you all to the situation. Uh, it's definitely not uh, way more easy to work in Russia for foreigners. I know my best friend from France have some problems to work in Greenland, for example. So it doesn't matter really. It's not super unique problems for Russia and they they have these permissions and they applications and they need to wait and it costs a lot, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, it's some uh, some particular features, but it's nothing really unique, super unique. Is Russia is not standalone. And inside our group uh, of collaborators, we just very very often repeat that the researchers has no nationality. We are working for future well-being. Uh, uh, best uh, knowledge to get so it doesn't matter you are from Norway United Kingdom or Russia etc etc inside our society we would like to keep this uh, soil you know soul or how to say that and indeed uh, I do uh, agree that the, if you are working together in the collaboration in a very fair collaboration with the Russian partner when you share the methods the protocols the discussions the uh, the, the, of course, writing the manuscripts, etc., etc., then it's uh, way more productive. But Yulia is totally right here. Unfortunately, the, to say that the average level of, of many researchers in Russia, it's a little bit low, first of all, about English knowledge, for example. It's not super easy for them to speak during Zoom meetings, to answer emails, to to work on the protocols, to, to even to use the comment function, function in the word, Microsoft Office, you know, all these basic things, unfortunately. And that's why I highly um, uh, invest and I highly support and I am ready to give all my money to young researchers. The, the future is yours and you need to be enthusiastic and you need to interrupt each other always and you need to speak English and, and, and Spanish and Russian and Nenets, of course. So, and that's why I highly welcome this Kirill Violeta, for example, from our lab. We have so many news to share and that's why I highly support the social media activity in Instagram and everywhere. We need to speak loudly and this is very important. And... Um, Yes, and uh, I have also a very nice discussion laying in the little uh, little water body close to sauna in, in Swedish castle last uh, February, just before lockdown, with one Sami representative. And he gave me a fantastic explanation of the situation, kind of explanation, and the side of the explanation, which I, which I am not thinking much before. Uh, the, the explanation is for the really for the not uh, for the foreigner researchers to work in Russia. It's basically the explanation. It's just number of the researchers is dramatically higher than in Russia. In Russia, you see, for example, I can't remember well, Trump says your town. 6,000 people and like 3,000 of them one way or another connect with the university, you know. So, can you hear me well? 
<laughs> yeah. So they, you, uh, in the in the Western countries, you are just uh, way, way more researchers. And I, as we discussed, Mark, with you and with many others, um, my vision is that Yamal need at least 800 high quality plant ecologists, for example, and 900 mammologists, et cetera, et cetera. It's so many things to do here. So, and that's why I believe it's very important to welcome uh, many researchers. And again, there is no, no nationality and there is uh, 10 o'clock in the evening now. I start to repeat my thoughts. Interrupt me, Mark. <laughs> Thanks. No, I don't interrupt you. You, you finished. Uh, so yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, Sasha. Yeah, I think there is a lot there to, to think of. Um, definitely at times I feel uh, that uh, we are so, uh, so many in so small communities, especially when we are about to ask questions to the community that uh, I wonder how many how, how many surveys has the average uh, uh, Nenet been been subject to by different uh, social scientists asking you know different aspects of the same question over and over and uh, etc. So definitely I, I can relate to to that uh, to that comment by the Sami uh, the Sami uh, Swedish uh, person. Um, mm -hmm. All right, so uh, we are running we're running into the into the end of the of the seminar. But if someone has any question for Yulia or 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 Saule, uh, I, would I would like to second. I would like to second Sasha's comment, and um, it's quite a, a strange question for me from Rosa. To be honest, I have never faced with the foreign agent situation when actually implementing uh, or doing any kind of collaborative research. Uh, as I I've been involved in Interact for. 10 years already, and I do uh, field work with a lot of uh, scientists from abroad um, for more than 10 years. So I haven't had these this issues before. Um, maybe you had, that's not much common, but uh, as I said, uh, as I have already said, and uh, Soli also said, uh, to make a, um, a collaborative project, you need to have a good partner, the flexible Russian partner, which is very important. And also you need to, um, to have a very good instruction on what to, what to do and how to <laughs> approach and access Russian Arctic, for example. It is very much, uh, it is very important. And we I actually did it with, I think with Arctis team, uh, we made a big instruction on uh, dates, uh, um, what to, uh, where to apply, what to do with permissions and so on. There is still much to do uh, with the with permissions themselves, um, and we hope that um, this will be overcome um, in a due course. And also, we actually, um, as I uh, am involved in uh, ICERO group, as has been already mentioned, uh, we are going to adopt uh, some kind of a agreement letter, which is um, endorsing uh, the international scientists uh, who are coming to Russian Arctic, and we make a reference to um, uh, to the agreement on enhancing international collaboration, which has been signed um, uh, in at the Arctic Council. So it, it, there, there are quite a few different mechanisms that can be actually uh, used. Yeah. Can I answer? Yes. Of course. Yeah, well, I'm talking about foreign agencies and so on, and other things as a joke, just to explain about necessity of getting permissions also. And I said that we need just to make uh, our aims and purpose of work as transparent as possible when we are talking to officials in order to come and to get permissions and visa and other things. That's all what I, what was my meaning of things. Yeah, I didn't say any special thing. I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of visa, there is a sp specific pr procedure, and I think that uh, uh, we've uh, um, we had a lot of different instructions on that um, when and to where you need to uh, apply to. And regarding permissions, um, it is always a messy issue for the Russian Arctic. Um, uh, yeah, still. But we, we, we hope that it will be um, discussed and um, will be made easier. Um, and we had a lot of discussions on that with uh, Sasha as well. Yeah. Great. I can, sorry, can I just very yeah. briefly, I'd like to take this opportunity since we're talking now about having good Russian colleagues is just to thank Yulia 
and Apex Russia, and I guess Cola Science Center as well for being our collaborative uh, great colleagues in Russia. Otherwise, I don't know, I, I don't think UKPN would have been able to pull something off like this without knowing where we're going, without having people who knows, like, I don't know, even with booking accommodations and uh, pointing us uh, in the direction of the right restaurant to go and get some vegan food or something like that. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sala. It's always great to uh, to work uh, within the team of great, uh, dedicated, enthusiastic young scientists and senior scientists as well. <laughs> I think that it's an, a very successful collaboration on all fronts from facilitators and Henry uh, and Tatiana to senior scientists and young scientists. So uh, this is the, the great collaboration at, at all the levels. Great. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I wish all the best in the future for the Arctis initiative. Definitely, I think it deserves a, a basically continuation and continuity. So I hope I hope that after COVID, uh, things uh, yeah things uh, kind of clear in many dimensions and levels, including the funding um, that can go on. Definitely, I think it's a worth uh, initiative. And I wanted to thank you again, uh, Yuli and Saule, for for your seminar and to the to the attendants for being so proactive in, in the discussion afterwards. I think this is probably, you know, it's, it's a great feeling uh, that after, after a seminar, there is, there is a plenty of interchange of, 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 of questions and, and opinions. Uh, so thank, thank you all of you for coming and also all of you who asked and intervened uh, since they, you, made, you made this much, much, more, much more interactive. And our series will continue next week. This time, after uh, th th this time, is going to be a UK-based researcher, uh, Professor Mary Edwards from the University of Southampton, who has ample experience in in, in working in the Varangian region of uh, the Far East of of, of Russia. And uh, same time, uh, same day next week, uh, we're gonna we're gonna have her. And of course, you are all invited, and you should receive uh, information about the event as as it will as it will be announced. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much, and uh, especially to the speakers and to everyone. And, and, and see you in future uh, seminars. Bye. Thank you so. Thank you so much, Mark. Bye bye, bye, bye everyone. Bye everyone. See you again. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Sasha. Bye.